On the morning of August the 6th, 1945, the American bomber Enola Gay took off for the Japanese archipelago. In its bomb bay was an atomic device nicknamed Little Boy. The target was Hiroshima, an industrial city with 340,000 inhabitants. At 8.15 a.m., the bomb was dropped, creating a blast equivalent to 15,000 tons of TNT. A gigantic nuclear mushroom rose above the city. The temperature at ground zero reached 4,000 degrees. Seventy thousand were killed outright. The city was totally annihilated. It was as if we dropped a million conventional bombs on the city. One million bombs. The irradiation would continue to claim numerous victims for dozens of years. The total death toll in Hiroshima was 140,000. The level of devastation from one small weapon was unprecedented in humankind. Three days after Hiroshima, a second atomic bomb was dropped over the city of Nagasaki, immediately killing 45,000. These two bombs dealt a final blow to the Japanese Empire, which surrendered on September the 2nd, 1945. The Second World War was over. The United States was hoisted to the rank of superpower. We're proud. I, I, think, I think that the way the war ended so fast and saved many lives. In that sense, I'm proud of what I did. I'm not proud of a mass destruction. But what is less well known is that Germany had been leading the way. The Americans were convinced that Hitler was on the point of acquiring a nuclear weapon, and they were going to do everything to prevent him from getting there first. This is very important. If the Germans get this bomb before we do, Hitler will win. And the world will be dominated by the Third Reich for a thousand years. Hitler had an 18-month start, so it was urgent. The Americans launched the biggest secret operation of all time, a colossal budget of $26 billion and the world's best scientists, codename Project Manhattan. The scientists engaged on this project were fanatic about trying to solve it and make sure that it was going to work and that it would be delivered on time. There was tremendous pressure on them. The project was top secret. 600,000 people were working on ultra-secure sites throughout the United States, hidden away from the eyes of the world. Not even the US Congress was kept in the loop. Security, security, security was the key in Los Alamos. I mean, everybody lived and breathed security 24-7, constantly. An astonishing race against time, played out in parallel, this time between themselves and their allies, as the Soviets, too, were desperate for the bomb. This race at the end of the war about brain power from the German scientists and uranium was a great competition uh, between the Allied forces. And the Allies had no hesitation in using spies. He was one of the most cleverest and most brilliant scientists ever to be involved in that. Klaus Fuchs was probably the most important spy ever in the history of espionage. We're going to reveal to you the story of this incredible secret competition, an insane race with no holes barred, and with the destiny of the world at stake. Germany, early 1930s. Adolf Hitler had just been appointed Chancellor of the Reich. Though the country had become militarily one of the most powerful in the world, 
It also led in another domain, that of science. Germany was a pioneer in disciplines such as chemistry and physics. For almost 40 years, it had been the nation with the most Nobel Prize winners, such as Max Planck, the energy specialist, Albert Einstein, and a certain Werner Heisenberg, one of the most brilliant atomic researchers in the land, generally thought of as a genius. To the eyes of the world, Germany seemed to be an extremely scientifically advanced country. In the world of intelligence, they had codes and Enigma, the encoding machine. In terms of weapons, they had the most modern aircraft, and Germany had a place apart, a breeding ground for science and scholars. But Hitler's anti-Semitic laws led to the exile of many brilliant scientists, including Albert Einstein, who settled in the USA. It all began one day in August 1939, when Einstein was vacationing on the East Coast, on the residential Long Island. His vacation would be less peaceful than planned. That day, he received a visit from one of his colleagues and friends, Leo Zilard, a Jewish-Hungarian physicist who had also left his country when faced with the rise of Nazism. He had come to make a highly important revelation to Einstein. On the terrace of his holiday home, he explained how Germany was exploiting a new source of energy, uranium, which could lead to the creation of devastating weapons. Without delay, Einstein decided to write a letter to the President of the United States himself, Franklin D. Roosevelt. And this is what he explained. I understand that Germany has actually stopped the sale of uranium from the Czechoslovakian mines, which he has taken over. The uranium will in the near future be converted into a new source of energy. This new phenomenon might also lead to bombs of a new type being constructed. A single bomb of this type carried by boat and exploded in a port might very well destroy the whole port together with some of the surrounding territory. It doesn't mince his words. He says that the Germans are working on this project and it will be enormously destructive. He thinks it's very important that the president be aware of this and understand that this could mean the beginning of some kind of German bomb program. Roosevelt became aware of the letter and the information terrified him. He was right to be worried. As at the same time, events in Europe were moving along a pace. In September 1939, Hitler first sent his troops to attack Poland, then to conquer France, and finally to threaten Great Britain. The Second World War was underway. In just a few months, Hitler had conquered a large part of Europe. But with war looming, American public opinion forced Roosevelt to remain neutral. Yet it was impossible to stand still and watch as a nation as powerful as Germany gained possession of a weapon of mass destruction. The USA needed absolutely to have the same thing in order to defend itself should the need arise which is just what Roosevelt told his advisors. Roosevelt listens and says, I see what you're telling me is that we have to be careful that our neighbor doesn't blow us up. We'll do something about this, says the president. So as not to be left behind, Roosevelt summoned scientists entrusted with a feasibility study for the atomic bomb. At that point, the project was very small, just a dozen men and a budget of barely $100,000. But one event turned everything upside down. On December the 7th, 1941, Japan, Germany's ally, attacked the US fleet at its Pearl Harbor base in the Pacific. The United States joined the war. I ask that the Congress declare a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. Just days later, 
It was Hitler's turn to declare war on the United States. Now the country could become one of Germany's targets. The Allies are very conscious that Germany is an immense power, both in terms of its military and its scientists. Uh, they are frightened. They knew that Hitler was a ruthless man, that he would not hesitate to use this bomb if he had a chance. If they could get the bomb first, then they would probably use it on London or Washington. Or Building an atomic device became Roosevelt's absolute priority, and he was convinced that Germany and the USA were locked in a race against the clock. Whoever had the bomb first would win, and according to the president, the Reich already had a head start. They might be as much as a year or a year and a half ahead of the United States program, and that could mean that they could have a bomb by Christmas of 43, summer of 1944, and it would be devastating. To make an atomic bomb, something no one has ever done, and also claw back an 18-month lead, Roosevelt's challenge appeared insane. So he pulled out all the stops. In all, more than 600,000 people were recruited. Factories and entire towns were erected in just months. In spanking new laboratories, the world's best scientists worked on the most absolute secrets with unlimited resources. The code name for this groundbreaking military program was Project Manhattan. At its head, two men with radically different profiles, Leslie Groves, the soldier, and Robert Oppenheimer, the scientist. Groves was chosen by Roosevelt himself to run the program. The man had an extraordinary profile. He was both a general and an engineer, and his experience was unquestioned. He had built the Pentagon, the biggest headquarters of any of the world's military forces. General Groves has been called the indispensable man of the Manhattan Project. He was a dynamo. He had more energy. He was more decisive than anyone among his peers, or at least it seems so. He said any difficult problem should be solved within one hour. He was a tall, bulky, domineering, powerful. He said, all right, and he immediately went to work. His first mission, to find the man to lead the scientists. He selected Oppenheimer, a brilliant physicist who taught in California at Berkeley. But his choice stunned the scientific community because Oppenheimer wasn't seen as the best in his field. People said, Groves is choosing Oppenheimer. That's very strange. Oppenheimer has never, he's never administered anything. He's never uh, accomplished uh, what some of these other scientists. Uh, there were already Nobel Prize winners uh, participating in the early stages of the, of the project. But Groves always chose younger people who still had a lot of energy and ambition to achieve a goal. And he saw that in Oppenheimer. He saw it immediately. The choice was all the more surprising in that Oppenheimer's style was far removed from that of the authoritarian and uncompromising Groves. So Oppenheimer, in contrast, he looks like a very sensitive poet, which he was. He carried in his pocket the poetry of Baudelaire. He was uh, really an operatic character. He was a philosopher. He spoke seven languages. He studied the Indian scriptures. He was um, a hugely sensitive man. Despite significant differences between the two men, Roosevelt put all his trust in the duo and gave them carte blanche. Groves' responsibilities from the outset were ones of uh, extraordinary power. He had uh, the full resources of the U.S. government behind him, uh, any amount of money that he wanted. Um, he could have anything that he needed. He saw early on that there was going to be a competition for resources, and thus he needed first priority on any material that he wanted, if it was copper or gold or silver or anything, he had to have first priority. Groves' first problem, where to create the infrastructure to make the bomb? They couldn't build it in a laboratory in a city. 
The equipment needed was colossal. The uranium enrichment plant alone was one kilometer long, and there were other demands. Groves wanted the sites to be isolated because they were top secret. He didn't want people to know. They were also dealing with first of the kind facilities, uh, building a nuclear reactor uh, that would get to be uh, two and three thousand degrees in the center. And, you know, for all they knew, they could blow up. They had not built one of these. You know, they had to plan um, for a buffer zone to make sure that there were no people in anywhere near these facilities in case something went wrong. In addition, Groves didn't want the bomb built on just one site, but on three. As being unknown territory, they had to try several methods. A first, immense complex was built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to make uranium. Then a second in Hanford, near Seattle, to produce plutonium. They had yet to find the ideal location for the third site, the most crucial, the one where the bomb would be assembled. And that required an even more isolated, even more secret location. Groves was at a loss. Oppenheimer had an idea. In November 1942, he took Groves to the American Southwest, New Mexico. Oppenheimer knew the area because he had a ranch in New Mexico and loved New Mexico. It was, it's a beautiful place. It's, it's gorgeous. And um, they go around and, and Groves is saying, no, not this place, not this place, not this place. Do you, and he says to Oppenheimer, do you know any other places? And Oppenheimer says, well, there's this school. There's this Los Alamos Ranch School up on the Mesa over here. Groves and Oppenheimer come upon this scene of boys out exercising and immediately Groves said, this is it, that's it. So they closed the school, they got the boys off, off, and they took over what was already a beginning of a, a place to live and stay. 